Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vaga Maradian here at the Association of the United States Army's annual meeting and trade show in Washington, D.C. Our coverage here is sponsored by AM General, Elbit Systems of America, General Motors Hydrotech, L3 Technologies, and Leonardo DRS. We do a lot of fun things uh, as part of the Defense and Aerospace Report, and I'm a f giant fan of history, uh, a student of, the, of World War I, and then to have the opportunity to talk to Chris Ruff, uh, who is a curator at the Center, United States Army's Center of Military history at uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina is a real honor. Um, Chris, thanks very much. Um, you know, World War I was uh, it's such an important conflict in U.S. history. It's when the United States sort of emerged as a superpower or certainly emerged as a world power on the, on the world stage. Um, and, you know, looking at what soldiers carry today and what soldiers throughout history have carried going back to the Revolutionary War, you, you know, the, every study has shown that, that soldiers in the Revolutionary War were carrying as much on their back as a current trooper is today. Talk to us a little bit, you know, and it was also the war where the overseas cap uh, was, uh, made, made, its, uh, made its debut. Talk to us a little bit about what a soldier in World War I was carrying, um, the kind of equipment they were, they were issued, um, you know, because in, in some respects it's the same and in other respects it's, it's very different. Yes, exactly as you say. So uh, what I have here arrayed on the table is the basic infantryman's pack from that era. So everything here is uh, 100 years old. So this is called the Model 1910 Haversack. And it's uh, a bit over-engineered for what it is. I must confess it's a rather difficult piece of kit to use. But it's supposed to contain only the bare essentials that soldiers need to function and survive in the field with. So the pack uh, is created with a soldier at the time that weighed about 150 pounds they determined that they should carry no more than about a third of their full body weight for heavy marching orders, so that dictates a basic 50-pound pack. Right. But in reality, it far exceeded that when you're adding things like a, a gas mask, a steel trench helmet, supplemental emergency rations, perhaps extra ammunition, an extra pair of hobnailed trench boots, uh, a heavy woolen overcoat, so often it far exceeded that. So you were talking about the the load of the Revolutionary War soldier. Uh, the infantryman's mission obviously remains the same. It's to provide, you know, disciplined fire against the enemy, uh, occupy ground, and so the mission was obviously the same in the First World War, but the stuff is a little different. And so if you like, we can check out what we have here on the table and I could go through it and tell you what it means. Um, I, I'd love to. Now, the first question, though, before we get into the pack is, when it came to uniform issue, right, wool, great uh, material, uh, both both warm, cool, uh, it keeps you warm when you're wet, but it also uh, doesn't stink or takes a lot to get it to stink, well, unless it come pre-stunk. Yeah, in the squalid conditions of the trenches, uh, it was just a battle surviving in those type of elements. Um, the wool uniform is a uh, really pretty wonderful natural fiber. It is the stuff of military uniforms since the ancient Roman army times at least. And so uh, I believe the last wool uniform that U.S. soldiers wore in combat was likely World War II in Korea. Right. And so since then, cotton has dominated the uniforms. Uh, there's a layering system involved. Uh, you have modern Gore-Tex and performance fabrics, synthetics that don't do what natural fibers do. But uh, the wool uniform I have on here is the model of 1917. Uh, this is what our American doughboys in the trenches used. Now these uniforms they did produce in a cotton summer weight version, mm -hmm. but um, those are typically uh, not what they used in France. So um, on the exterior of my pack here is a heavy woolen overcoat. And uh, this uh, can double as a wool blanket, so it's a pretty amazing garment. But once it gets saturated with, say, rainwater and coated in mud, it becomes an extremely heavy garment. So uh, it's burdensome just to survive in those conditions right. that was expected. And how many um, uniforms, so when you got into the service, how many uniforms were you issued? Uh, and, and then let's then take a look at what's in, what's in the pack. Sure, well, your basic issue, I believe you see uh, at least two service coats, wool service coats. Like I said, they made this garment in a summer weight cotton. You also had a wool service shirt, a couple of those at least, a couple pair of breeches, but that doesn't mean that you carried all those items at one time on your person. But 
um, we mentioned this, the same uniform they wore at this time in World War I for combat as well as general service. Uh, there were fatigue uniforms as well made out of denim, but those typically weren't general issue. So what I have on is the appearance of the World War I soldier. So then let's let's take a look at the pack and what's in here uh, and sort of contrast it with what some of the things folks have in their pack today. Well, sure. So this is a modular pack. I have my trench helmet here that I'll go ahead and remove. So the top portion contains only the bare bone essentials that you need in the field. Uh, the exterior uh, bag on the top, this is called your meat can pouch. Uh, meat can is just a period word for your mess kit. It's made out of lightweight aluminum. Uh, it's very similar to modern styles, except today it's not made out of aluminum, but stainless steel. And so within the same pack are my eating utensils, so a uh, fork and spoon, and I also have a knife in the side and a little leather sheath to keep it from poking a hole in the bag. Uh, underneath of the, the meat can pouch is my uh, personal entrenching tool, and this is a, uh, a T-handle shovel in form. Uh, it's in a carrier up underneath of this for easy access. Um, so in the top portion of the pack, I'll go ahead and undo it. Um, I must tell you that the pack is not a bag of any sort. What it is, it's a series of flaps and straps. Right. In order to get anything out of it, you basically have to disassemble it. Right. So it's pretty difficult to use. So the modern soldier is gifted in that they have very well thought out ergonomic gear that works quite well. So if they need something, they can reach in their bag and retrieve it within a matter of moments. But this one, let's look at here. So I have to undo these three straps that pull through cloth loops sewn to this flap. Okay, so give me a moment. Sure. No, 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 <laughs> please take your time, Chris. And is this muslin? I mean, what is this? No, sir, this is cotton canvas. Cotton canvas, okay. Yep. So once I pull all these through. I'm not as good at fabrics as I'd like to be. You know? Yeah, well, cotton <laughs> is what they made this equipment out of. So this is an original pack from the era. So now I have the top portion open. So now I can retrieve, say, my boots got soaking wet in the bottom of the muddy trench. I have to put on some dry socks. So now I can finally get up my wool socks. So, um, so a basic change of undergarments in here. Uh, I have my emergency rations, basically. Ideally, the soldiers would be given hot chow from a field kitchen, but the reality is that warm food uh, rarely reach the soldier in time. It would be cold, a barrage would be underway, perhaps the food wouldn't reach you, so therefore you would have to rely on your preserved meat ration, which is contained in this, what they call a bacon tin. And, and how heavy How heavy is that? Well, well, that's not that bad. Yeah, you have to keep in mind it's empty at this point. Ah, uh -huh, right, okay. So I don't have any period, uh, you know, meat from 1917. Right. You don't have anything festering in there. Uh. Yes, it's quite clean, <laughs> but uh, the tin container helps to keep that meat ration from spoiling the other contents of your pack. Uh, in here I have some personal effects, a sewing kit, a soldier's wallet, extra buttons, insignia. Uh, there's a pair of um, identity discs or dog tags from the era. This has the soldier's nationality, his name, and his serial number. Uh, just prior to World War I, dog tags became a general issue item, and you'll see the photographic evidence of that times indicates that you had to wear these. So when it came to inspection time, soldiers had to pull them outside of their coat collars to indicate that, yes, indeed, they were wearing them as prescribed by regulations. Well, because of high death rates and the need to identify bodies. Exactly. So that need was painfully uh, obvious in the... Uh, the late unpleasantness of the war between the states, the Civil War, and there was a large quantity of uh, dead on the battlefield that remain unknown to this day. That was also the case in World War I, but at least there was a concerted effort to identify the fallen uh, with these identity discs, what we later call dog tags. Right. Uh, the other contents of my pack here is a change of undergarments, um, and then uh, also a portion of the ration was tobacco was extremely important. Uh, anything to keep the soldier awake, alert, and would give them a pause from the tremendous hardships that they had to endure. Uh, in addition to that, I have uh, hard bread, which is kind of akin to Civil War hardtack, would be in the pack. Uh, this here is called a condiment tin. 
Uh, it's separated into three compartments, the cap and then the middle pieces in two compartments. This would often contain a mixture of coffee and sugar and then salt and pepper in one end. Hmm. Uh, once again, coffee was uh, heavily relied upon, especially American soldiers. It's, you know, cup of joe is a famous expression from the era because in the days of the fleet, under Josephus Daniels, he replaced the old alcohol ration with coffee. It was just a sign of the time. So coffee was a big thing. And um, and the Navy's been suffering ever since. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. I suppose you could say that. But uh, here is uh, a portion of my toiletry kit. So it's really quite small. Um, I have a little soap dish, my cleaning towels, uh, handkerchief, shaving brush. Um, grooming standards, uh, men typically are clean shaven at this time. Uh, it was practiced to shave uh, for a couple reasons, sanitation one, and the other reason was to ensure a close fit on your gas mask because this is the advent of chemical weapons in World War I. Right. Uh, so here I have uh, an example of a safety razor. Now safety razors existed uh, prior to World War I, but these were kind of a new tool. So this is one that would break down into a very small package and you would assemble it to shave. Um, I have my uh, grandfather's, several of my grandfather's um, uh, razors that were very similar to this. Yeah. And, he, and he had, because he traveled, you know, he had the travel version, he had the home version and things like that. And my dad, who used to use these also, my dad is 90, uh, uh, 95 yeah. uh, now, mm -hmm. um, and, and, and next week will be 96. Uh, and, and so um, my dad still says, best shave I ever got was, was from those razors, so for, for what that's worth. Yeah, and they're quite effective, and so they became popularized and available for the civilian market, but this was particularly made for military personnel at the time. So let's move now, and, and so these are buttons, right? Is that, is that what's in there? Yeah, it's part of the, shape, the uh, sewing kit. Gotcha. So a basic thread, needle, and then buttons to replace the ones that would get snagged on barbed wire and whatnot. Um, yes, you know, you lose your buttons. You know, the heck with the injuries. You know, it's about losing the buttons on the barbed wire. So, <laughs> it, so that and that would be it for for that. And yeah. and so now, what is on the bottom part of this? Well, the bottom contraption. Of the pack, uh, by means of a leather strap and a pack extender, this can be taken off because the bottom portion contains your shelter half, uh, a woolen blanket your tent pins, ropes, and a three-piece folding pole that's about as long as the bottom portion of the roll because you could take that off because obviously you don't need to fight with that. Right, but it, it's pretty impressive. I mean, actually, if you consider what's in that, that's actually a pretty impressive amount of stuff to fit in a relatively small space. It is, but obviously, as I've demonstrated how long it took me to get into the thing, <laughs> it's not a very user-friendly design, but this was updated in 1928 and used all throughout the Second World War as well with some minor improvements. Right. So it was a pretty long-lived pattern. Um, and I also love, by the way, the, 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 the issue twine with which you can conveniently wrap your coat around yeah. the top of the bag. That's right. So there's no uh, provisions to make a, a roll of your overcoat so you're either wearing it or it's a hasty stow around the exterior of your pack. Now, one last question. How comfortable or uncomfortable is this uniform? Well, the uniform is lined in really pretty soft cotton, so the body is quite comfortable, but the collar uh, chafes a bit because it's unlined. And period photographs show a lot of servicemen from the time taking their shirt collars and pulling them out over their coat collars because they tend to chafe. Uh, so having a wool allergy is not very good if you're in the Army at this time. And uh, what about the issue boots? Um, soldiers, as far as, I, I've only covered this for 25 years, and I haven't met many soldiers who really like their issue boots until relatively recently, where comfort, you know, this, they, all the military started getting it. I mean, it's funny to me talking to even guys, British Army, you know, we all complain about their boots. So how are those? Well, um, I've broken these boots in really quite well. These are um, faithful replicas of the original trench boot from World War I. Um, but an all leather boot, they're pretty easy to break in. Uh, it's rubber that doesn't really mold to your foot very well, but it's very durable. Uh, of course, you can sneak up on somebody with rubber soled boots. Uh, these ones uh, have leather soles and heels. Oh, right, and you've got hobnails there. Yeah, that's you've right. You've got hobnails. So um, leather hobnailed boots are nothing new. Once again, like the wool uniforms, they go all the way back to the ancient Romans army. 
but uh, hobnails serve two functions. One, they provide a little bit of traction in grassy terrain, but their primary function is to keep the leather soles from wearing out so quickly.